Good evening and welcome. Um, it is now six o'clock and I'm going to hand over to Dr. Mzongo. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues and distinguished healthcare professionals. I'm truly honored to connect with you today as we embark on a discussion that holds tremendous significance for the future of healthcare in South Africa. Our meeting today represents a critical moment in our ongoing efforts to enhance the quality of care we provide to patients, our fellow citizens, whilst ensuring the sustainability of the entire healthcare system. In the realm of healthcare, one thing is certain, change is inevitable. The traditional fee-for-service that we are also used to has been the cornerstone of our industry for decades, but it is increasingly apparent that it may not be the most effective or equitable approach to meet the evolving needs of our patients and the challenges faced by our healthcare system. Today, we come together to explore alternative reinvestment models. These are innovative approaches that have the potential to revolutionize the way we deliver and pay for healthcare services in South Africa. Our objective is to assess how these payment models can benefit both patients and healthcare providers while addressing some of the pressing issues we face, such as rising cost of care, resource constraints, and unequal and uneven access to care. At the heart of this discussion is the understanding that our profession is not just about treating diseases, it is about caring for people. Patients place their trust in us during their most vulnerable moments, and it's our responsibility as healthcare professionals to ensure they receive the best possible care aligned with their individual needs and preferences. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, summer board member, Professor Jacques Neyman, who will unpack the role that clinicians play in the ARM space. Professor Sneiman is a renowned expert in various fields of clinical pharmacology and has contributed significantly to the advancement of clinical pharmacology in South Africa. He has lectured extensively both locally and abroad on various topics and is widely published in various scientific and mass media journals and publications. Prof Sneiman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sandile. I'm just checking if um, you can go right. Let me just quickly share. Good. I've been yeah. led to believe that that's working. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Sandile, and thank you to the audience. I think, uh, um, given that we've only got an hour. I'm going to focus a lot on alternative reimbursement, especially for more expensive new technology developments. But, uh, but typically, alternative reimbursement models are also available for when we look at other treatments, when we look at bundled care, when we look at outcomes-based reimbursement. And this is not only just for outcomes reimbursement for a medicine or a device, but can also be outcomes-based reimbursement if one starts looking at the holistic treatment plan, which will include also your other clinicians. So uh, this is a, a, a new and evolving environment, and it's going to look at actually the outcomes for uh, what is delivered to patients in order to drive that reimbursement. For instance, uh, some hospitals in the United States are already looking at reimbursement and readmission rate. So is the, as soon as the readmission rate goes up, your reimbursement goes down so that you purchase value for that particular patient in sense of clinical outcomes. Now let's focus a little bit on medicine. So my favorite quote is this one of uh, uh, old outgoing president of the Glaxo at the time says, 90% of patients with chronic diseases do not benefit from their treatment. Uh, one can argue why, it's because your number of needed to treat is so big and because one cannot identify the type of patient. I cannot predict those who will benefit. I'm just looking now at hypertension as a disease. It's not that easy to understand if I treat everybody with 140 over 90, who will actually benefit from lowering the blood pressure to 130 over 80 or 120 over 80. 
it becomes difficult. Nowadays, we're starting to get better and better with more precise medicine, and we're going down to personalized medicine so that I can actually identify who will benefit or has a bigger chance of benefit from the treatment, and I can measure a response. And based on that particular proxy that I measure, I can decide on what to reimburse for that response that I'm seeing. So this is where we're moving to, and, 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 and I think that's what we're going to explore now. So access to high cost treatments, the elements to consider is the price. In other words, what are we paying for? The impact, the cost of care, impact on the patient, but also in society in general, duration of the disease, what is, what is the benefit that they will get? And then the cost to society, and often this is not really explored in the South African context because we look at an insurance model and we're not necessarily looking at what is it costing the rest of society for this patient not contributing longer into society by treating this patient, making the patient stay at work longer and so forth. So that type of, uh, of uh, cost to society and the willingness to pay is often not completely calculated the way that the Europeans do at this point in time. And then obviously one must also look at the right to care and then who does it? Who, 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 who say I can get treatment? Who say I must stop treatment? And at what stage does it happen? And then at the end is almost to say whose duty of care, whose responsibilities, where does the doctor fit in? Where does society fit in? And what is the morally correct thing to do? So South Africa's challenges, and I don't want to, to, to embroider on this a lot because some of the other speakers will do. Uh, this more adjusted, but basically differential pricing is something that the pharmaceutical and the device industry has started for a long, long period of time now. <clears throat> so they categorize countries and say that if you're a richer or a higher GDP country, you can afford more. And as soon as your GDP goes down, I should charge you less to such an extent that at certain stage, you're almost uh, giving the product into that lower cost environment. So you you the higher GDP funds, whereas the lower cost, lower GDP gets. But the problem is then comparative pricing. Where is it cheaper? Uh, and often people look at other countries and say, well, if it's that price there, I want it the same price. And eventually it becomes economically unsustainable for the supplier. And then you get failure to launch in that particular environment. So SCP, and you will see that as a regulation that has its place, but a simplified concept, and, uh, and one needs to look at, can we do better than just simply uh, the SCP and say that SCP is the only way of preventing corruption, and one needs to look at how do we give access using the ability within the Act where the minister can exempt a product from necessary SCP, but let's move on. Just to give you a UK NSS, uh, perspective. The NHS in the UK uh, negotiates a price with a pharmaceutical company or device company after doing a health technology assessment and decide whether it falls within that particular threshold of affordability and cost effectiveness. Based on that, they then make a, a decision in collaboration with that entity to decide what is the price that, price that they will reimburse and they follow it up over time to ensure that the outcome is actually there. Now, that discount or that price is not widely published. You still have the list price in the UK, and you have the purchase price. The fact that most people know what's the purchase price doesn't make it referenceable outside of the UK. Only the list price is referenceable, and that is one of the models that one needs to explore within the South African context. Now, international referencing, as I've just uh, quickly glossed over, it's common practice by funders to use the international reference price to look at where I can get it cheaper. And in order to protect the entry of pharmaceutical companies into the market, they, they start looking at alternative reimbursement models. And not only in, in high GDP countries, but also in low GDP countries, because the benefit to the lower GDP countries is almost bigger than what it is for the higher GDP countries. So the exposure to this published list is often a problem. Just to give you an example, Trastuzumab in South Africa, we paid more for that in the private sector 
and what it was obviously available in the NHS in the UK for many, many years, purely because it was linked to the SCP. So one can argue that why do you not drop the price? Well, there's the willingness to drop the price, but the transparency makes it difficult because then you then need to reduce your price worldwide to that extent, and then it becomes an unviable proposition. Now, is it just us? No, obviously it's not just us. I'm just this is a, in the uh, uh, European landscape where they looked at can we afford new technology? How long will we be able to do that and actually safeguard our long term financial sustainability? And the reason for that is because of this uh, uh, way that we need to have incentive for, for industry to continue developing new medicine, meet unmet needs. But at the same time, you need to safeguard against uh, almost healthcare bankruptcy going forward. So in the European Union, they, you always look, we hear them talking about sort of uh, their solidarity-based access, typically to what we would see in NHI. And, but the EU member states are also a mix of states, and they don't all have the same GDP. The problem is, is that if I look at dropping the price in one uh, uh, environment, if it's referenceable, I need to do it in another environment, which immediately puts pressure on, is it sustainable for the pharmaceutical company to continue with that particular process? Now, obviously, we need to do health technology assessment. You need to be adaptable, adaptable so that when you look at the outcomes, you can change the model over time. So it's not necessarily fixed in concrete after you've decided because you're going to look at value. With other words, what's the clinical outcome? Moving uh, alternative reimbursement model needs to be linked to a value process as well. Now, just to give you an example, Within the European countries with very similar economies to ours, you can see if I go from Bulgaria, Bulgaria right down to Slovenia, you get the typical financial models, which is an undisclosed discount or a price volume agreement or free doses if you're above a certain or payback model. Uh, now, a payback model could either fall in the outcome based agreement or just in financial. Now, when we say that, you can look at bundle and other agreements, typically, and you can see many of the countries uh, participating in that, but also payment by result. What does it mean? It means only pay for those with the desired effect. Now, I will show you later that there's an objective way to measure this particular desired effect. So the desired effect needs to be almost uh, defined a priori, then you need to, dis to make sure that the patients who qualify are actually meet the particular entry criteria and that you exclude patients once they reach what we would call so-called stopping criteria. So if I, after a specific treatment period, do not see any benefit, you then I do apologize, you then stop the treatment and you then get reimbursed for so-called wasteful care. Because if there was no response, I've spent money but received no benefit for it. So that would be considered wasteful care. Now, let's look at it a bit deeper. So outcomes determine the price and or fundability of the particular intervention. So value-based pricing. The value-based pricing calculates and tries to earn the differentiated worth of its product for a particular customer segment when compared to its competitors. So if there's a competitor, you can compare it to the competitor, or when there is no competitor, is to best alternative or best supportive care. So the setting such as this would obviously refer to a specific market segment, identity, to find the attributes of the product, what actually differentiates the product. In oncology, it would be, for instance, your uh, uh, disease-free survival or your overall survival and so forth. So you may have different outcomes. For patients, uh, hepatitis, it could be cure or it could, could again be 
uh, uh, looking at preventing progression of disease. So in each, each disease, it may differ. And you may, for the same molecule, have differ, different models. So I may have, if I use the same molecule, say, for instance, for liver disease of one type and liver disease of another type, I may have different reimbursement strategies because in the one type, it may be a lot more successful than in the other type of that particular disease. All right. So it could be that you have different models on the same molecule. And then obviously one needs to look at how the consumers or the funders value this differential. Now, uh, we will get some input from consumer environment a little bit later, but it's important to understand what the patient perceives as value versus what a funder perceives as value because it may com be completely different. Uh, there we go. So there's a good paper by Lou Garrison and Adrian Tauser on value-based pricing and reimbursement and bringing it to personalized healthcare. And they look, so it's a good paper to a good read. But basically it says, it raises another set of issues around the use of this metric. We need to be able to identify and create extra value for the risk averse individual by reducing the uncertainty they face in about response to treatment. And when I say that, so if I look at the individual, it's about the individual facing uh, uncertainty, but it could also be that society faces uncertainty. I have a phase three study, but I don't know if in the real world that would pan out like this. So I may have an agreement to say I've reimbursed the product at this level, provided that you, you achieve the outcome that's been uh, seen in the phase three study. Or if not met, I will then reduce the reimbursement or I will only pay for certain, certain specific subtypes and so forth. So it is, as I said in the beginning, a dynamic field going forward. So Adrian Towers also said, single price disconnects price and value. So if I've got a single price for an item, it's not linked to the value of that particular process. Now, transparency is good for a procurement process. An alternative remit can, can increase competitive in and access. But we will hear later on that visibility and transparency is not necessarily the same process. The price of a product can be transparent and it can be available to all funders equally, but it doesn't necessarily have to be visible internationally. So if you soon as you look at value-based pricing, the question is, what is value? Now, immediately you say, what is value? Is who are you asking? Are you asking the patient or you're asking the doctor? Or are you asking the funder? Or are you asking society at large? And you might get different answers. So one needs to settle of what is the value that you're actually reimbursing. So outcomes-based pricing is a, is, a, is a form of risk sharing. And indication-based pricing is again linked to value. As I said, it can be linked to the particular indication of the medicine, and it may be different for different indications of the same product. And we need to align the incentive to realize that particular value. So critical views of current process, single transparent list price is not the best to provide access. There's legislative constraints across the world. Supply of healthcare is for for-profit business, whereas R&D is an incentive-driven business. So if there's no incentive, R&D will stop. However, budget constraints are real, and often real tangible outcomes are elusive. So who must fund the uncertainty? And that is where you want to put the uncertainty back onto the provider of the medicine to make sure that there's skin in the game, for lack of a better word, to make sure that in future that you get the value for, for what you intend for that particular individual. So the better I can identify those that will respond, the better the reimbursement environment. So the principal outcomes is patients achieve a better health, improved quality, providers achieve efficiency and greater patient satisfaction, 
The payer control cost and reduces the funder's risk, and the supplier aligns the price with the patient's particular outcome. So society becomes healthier with, while reducing overall healthcare spending, not only because you're treating specific outcomes, but also because you're targeting patients correctly into those that will respond. Now, South African models, we are not unique. We only follow what is happening in the world. For instance, if you look at immunotherapy for rare cancers, where potential responders can be easily identified with testing of tumor markers and genetic markers. So the number of potential patients can be calculated from data. It's known, the exposure is well known. The response is well published, ESA is not pioneering site. And examples of international successes can be reached and applied. So we can just simply use what's already known. We don't have to be innovative in this particular process. The only thing that one needs to negotiate is what is the value that we are going to reimburse at. So for instance, patient diagnosed and meets the inclusion criteria. A pharma company pays at your single exit price. However, you've got a review uh, in three months time. Patient meets stop criteria and say, well, there's no benefit to the patient. I stop and therefore why should any funder pay, even if it's the patient that's paying out of pocket, fund that particular innovation, there was no benefit. Or, yes, the benefit, patient benefits at three months. Let's follow up in three months. It's still benefiting six months. Now you pull at full value. And you continue to pay at full value. And there's no reimbursement because the patient achieved the benefit or the value that was set out. So, therefore, the risk settlement depends on what was achieved and where in the, in, in the route of cure that particular patient benefited. So there are multiple examples and one can set the criteria and different time horizons depending on the type of molecule and then multiple examples. As I showed you in, in low GDP countries, Italy, UK, you also see that. So the biggest barrier to access is not the price, but the willingness to make this work. So patients deserve new and innovation therapy. And it's our ethical duty to explore the access to care and make it happen. So the clinician's duty is to understand the concept of alternative reimbursement and benefits and limitation. I say that because often uh, us doctors try and sort of say, we will prescribe and it's the patient needs to fight the battle. Unfortunately, it's not so simple. The doctor remains the patient's advocate for access to care and needs to motivate irrespective of the funder. So to understand it's not one size fits all, that there's critical patient selection, and that we need to look at start and stopping criteria in a very, very objective way. And often it's good to have a peer review of that criteria in order to make sure that it's not the doctor in its own capacity having to make that particular decision. And then to decide on who will benefit most. So obviously a peer panel to adjudicate may come in very handy on those levels. So as a very short presentation, as you can see, we can delve into each one of those aspects a lot deeper, but due to time constraints, we'll stop here and we continue to one of the other speakers highlighting this particular point a little bit differently, and we will then take questions at the end. Thank you very much. Sandile, over to you. Thank you, Prof. Seyman. Uh, I'm not sure how you could pack so much information into such a short presentation in such a little time, but um, very, very insightful uh, presentation. Um, moving on um, to the next presentation, it's now my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Ms. Lauren Pretorias, who boasts extensive experience in both corporate and nonprofit organizations across South Africa. She co-founded Campaigning for Cancer in 2008 a patient advocacy organization that promotes and protects the rights of patients and those affected by cancer. The organization has also partnered with Friends of Cancer Patients to create patient, the Patient Advocacy Incubator, equipping patient advocacy organizations with professionals, professional and relevant skills to truly meet the needs of patients in the realm of advocacy. Over to you, Ms. Pretorius. Thanks, Anilia, and thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to share my slides so everyone can have a chat while I'm sharing, just to let everyone know that 
Um, today, I'm going to take a look at the advancement of medicine. It's something that we've all seen, but really understand what it means for patients. Um, so I often get this question, what is innovation? What does the advancement of medicine mean for patients? And the simple and, and sad tr truth of the matter is nothing if they can't access it. We can have all, this, all the research in the world. We can have the most amazing medicines, uh, health technologies, but if it doesn't get to that patient, it, it's as if that does not exist in the patient's life. And I'm sure as practitioners, you have the frustration of knowing that um, there is something that could perhaps help your patient out there, but they don't have access to it. So I wanted to talk about um, another part of innovation. And it's a story that I use to show you how innovation can integrate into, um, integrate into our lives. And this is probably something that we want for every single patient. So this is Gabriel. And Gabriel is six going on 36. Um, and when you ask him what he wants to be, he wants to be a soldier, although recently it's been an engineer, so he can build gun, guns for the soldiers. Um, what he'll probably be is a lawyer, because he can argue you. But the one thing that Gabriel loves is his animals, and his favorite animals are bunnies and the creepy crawly. And you ask, well, the creepy crawly is not really an animal. Well, this is where the lawyer comes in, because Gabriel will argue with you to say the creepy crawly lives in the water. It eats the leaves. And when you take it out the water, it goes and can't breathe and stops working. So it dies. Therefore, my brother has a graveyard of creepy crawlies in different models that Gabriel studies. Now, for most of you that might have to clean the creepy crawly a little bit of a history, the creepy crawly was actually designed in South Africa by a gentleman from Brussels that came to live in South Africa. So for a long time, the creepy crawly was something that was innate to South Africa, and it was something that was very innovative. But to a six-year-old in this generation, it's become part of his life. And it's become real. It's become his favorite animal. And my, my message here is surely we must be looking that innovation in medicine becomes real and becomes part of the life and a living thing and an accessible thing for patients. So the question is uh, on everyone's lips is how do we do this? Well, I thought I don't have those answers. It's a very, very complex um, process. But what I can tell you is I know what patients want. And patients want access to effective treatment. They want to know why a drug is essential. They want to know why are they being told to take something, some medication? What would be the benefit on, of that? And I'm sure you have seen where patients even sometimes patients that you that you um, perceive to have very little um, health literacy can make the decision of whether that is essential to their life or not and to their circumstances. Patients also want to contribute to the decision making process. They want to be be asked and want to tell what. It is, and this is very important with what Jacques said when it's, he spoke about what patients perceive as value. And they want timely decisions. They want decisions that they can have the latest access to those medicines and to that innovation so that there's not a delay in them accessing it to other, say, for instance, to other patients in other parts of the world. So where do you fit in as a person, as a healthcare practitioner. Well, we've heard tonight that the value of medicine should not be measured by cost alone, but by the benefits it brings to the individual patient and to society, i.e. value doesn't equal price. And this is something where, unfortunately, patients can't actively get involved in these discussions. They can be invited to, for consultation in some times, but the main advocate 
remain for patients are patient advocates such as myself and you as the healthcare provider. Because the patient doesn't know what he doesn't know. He doesn't understand the disease. He doesn't understand the financial models and 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 um and structuring of, of health finance. He doesn't understand public health. And most of the time, he doesn't understand the clinical interaction of the medicine or the health technology that you are prescribing to him. So expecting him to be his voice at that point in his journey is unreasonable for us. We have to do two things. We have to invite him to understand what he perceives as value, but we have to create it in such a way that it is easy for him to tell his story and for him to do that. So he's not threatened by that. And you as healthcare providers are the link to that because the patients have an enormous amount of trust in you. And the most trustworthy person in their in their um, in their journey should be their doctor. In fact, often, you know, I, in the position I have as heading up a patient, ad, a cancer advocacy organization, I often get a phone call from patients that say, you know, who's the best oncologist for this? Or I've got a friend who's got this, who's the best guy to send it? And most of the time I won't refer them to anyone because I'll say to them, well, who have you spoken to? And if you can see yourself walking down that road with that person during your treatment, then that's the doctor for you. Because this is a journey that you're going to walk with that healthcare professional. So for us, it's important that the healthcare professional is often highlighting some of the challenges in the road for the patient so that they can look at resources and making sure that they are getting the help they need. Now, I understand that you know this is important this is um this is really hard. you've got a lot of pra patients to see, and this is where patient come advocates and like myself and my organization come in because often we want to understand what matters to the patient. We want to understand the illness of their and how their illness and impacts their lives. We want to understand what the technology offers. I, I've dealt with a patient once that said to me, I lost trust in my doctor because I knew that they were going through a set of protocols when they knew at the end of the day that they should have put me on a particular treatment right in the beginning. But they had to go to a set, through a set of protocols to prove for my medical aid that, I, that they weren't going to work and therefore we could pay for the ultimate. Now, that's a huge amount of trust lost in you as a healthcare professional. And then what more needs to be done? How do we ensure that we're making sure that they're each patient, the fence, never mind the boxes, creating enough boxes, but they're fences that we remove for these patients. And for us, it's about helping them and helping you to translate what is happening and understanding what they perceive as value. And these can be done through health technology assessments. It can be held through patient surveys that we run like organizations like myself, patient service, patients' um, um, perceptions, patients' experiences. And all that information can be gathered and used in the processes that Jacques was speaking about. So what are we looking at? And, and I'm going to put a call to action out to each one of you because I'm an advocate and, and um, I'm going to be a little bit cheeky. But I want each one of you, when you're talking and you're thinking about this, to remember these three things and ask, these are the three things we need for patients. Number one is we need leadership. We need doctors and healthcare professionals and advocates to say, are people getting, are patients getting the right treatment at the right times with the least amount of challenges? Because if we're answering no to any one of those questions and any one of those um, principles, then the work's not done. We have more work to do as a country in expanding access and creating models and financial mechanisms that allow patients to have that access. And then innovation. Can we continue to with the same mindset that we had before or are we dead in the water? And I think that, you know, I've been doing this for the last 16 years and I pretty much think if we carry on the way we are, we're dead in the water. But there's opportunity for innovation. 
because as we innovate with medicines, the, the risk and the uncertainty becomes less because of, the, because of the innovation. With precision medicines and understanding diseases better and better diagnostics, if we advocate for that, eventually we can save the overall healthcare system money. And then the third call to action is, is commitment. So everyone says commitment, but I'd like to call you to action to de dedication because commitment is often seen as an obligation, but dedication to a cause is something that will help us forward into this process. And I hope that the dedication that you have to patients and to understanding what their illness and their circumstances are and finding a, a diagnosis becomes the dedication of walking down the road and highlighting for them the challenges and working with patient advocates and um, organizations like SAMA to make sure that we're telling people who are financing medication, health technology devices, all screening programs, what the patient perceives as value because we cannot start looking at price being equal to value. Value is an intrinsic thing that sits to our humanity and we need to carry on looking to that. So thank you very much and thank you for the time. Thank you very much, Lauren. I found your presentation and your insights about the patient perspective uh, incredibly interesting. Um, but uh, we'll come back to the Q&A a bit later on. I want to move on to our final speaker for tonight's session. Mr. Bada Parasi, CEO of the Innovative Pharmaceutical Association of South Africa, IPASA for short. Mr. Parasi has over 35 years of experience in pharmacy management, policy making and development, operational research, medicine legislation and procurement. He played a leading role in development and implementation of South Africa's national drug policy, which was adopted by cabinet in 1996 as, of, as the official country policy on drugs. Mr. Parasi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Mshongo. Let me see if the technology is going to agree with me. Can you all see my slides? Not yet. Really? Oh boy. Let me try again. Is it now visible? Not as yet, Bada. Oh boy. Uh, maybe we'll just take a more, give you a moment. These are the dangers of Zoom. <laughs> it's technology and let it not catch you out and uh, suddenly you show your age. Okay, let, let me try again. And give Bada a call and, and just help him through. Anything appearing as yet? Still not. Still not. Um, but at the bottom of the screen, there's a green icon that says uh, share screen. You must click on that. Yes, Renier, that's what I tried to do. Okay, let me cancel and start again. Share screen. Then you need to select the screen that you're sharing and then it will appear on this side. Something is coming up. We can see your, your Zoom screen now. So just put the presentation on top of that and full screen it. Excellent, we are live now. Okay, you, thank you, sorry about uh, that. Sorry, um, and then just click on that hide icon. Okay. 
Are yes. we on? 100%, thank you. Thank you. One of the things that I haven't learned in all my working life is how to deal with Zoom. Good evening, fellow healthcare professionals. Jacques has really dealt with all the key points and what Lauren has done is to place the patient squarely in the place where we all know that this is all about the patient. Mine is really to lay emphasis on a few points related to the need for alternative reimbursement models. The, the few points I would, I would like to make first is that ARMs is a logical consequence of sustainable financing, and I'll get into the concept in a moment. Secondly, Jacques did touch on this, but for emphasis, I will explain why visibility of net pricing is a challenge, and we do differentiate between transparency of pricing and visibility, that is external visibility of pricing. The Department of Health and our National Treasury do emphasize, they insist that pricing transparency is important in order to ensure there's no corruption in the country. And we cannot agree more with that. What we do say is when it comes to visibility of pricing externally, then it becomes a totally different matter. And therefore, which will take me to the third point, I will explain farmers' preference for differential pricing. And the last point I'd like to make is really to repeat what Jacques said in one of his last slides on the outcomes of arms. Now, there are three important elements that align the approach to achieving sustainable financing of innovative uh, therapies. And I make the point that arms is a logical consequence of sustainable financing as it pertains to innovative therapies. First of all, you have to ensure that prioritized sustainable and co coordinated mobilization of resources is in place, making equitable, effective, and efficient use of resources. And then finally, you should be able to answer the question, does spending equate with high quality results? And if you do that, you're on your way to achieving sustainable financing of innovative therapies. This places a responsibility on governments, payers, industry, both innovative and generic, to find ways for many more patients to have access to today's medicines and for future patients to benefit from new yet to be developed medicines. Intrinsically linked to this responsibility is for all role players to recognize the vital role of innovation and the need for an approach that adequately incentivizes innovation. Put differently, financing of innovative therapies requires ultimately the allocation of resources large enough to support innovation, while sustainability requires that payers find that the innovation delivers good value compared to other potential ways of allocating their resources. In line with the above approach, it is felt that governments should consider more holistic budgeting approaches that would include the cost of disease and the benefit that a medicine confers across budget silos. This would feed an evaluation that does not consider in isolation the impact of a medicine on the healthcare budget, but also accounts for the positive impact of improved outcomes delivered on tax revenues, worker productivity, and indirect healthcare expenditures. In so doing, governments can achieve optimal levels of healthcare spending and ensure systems strengthening across the spectrum of medical delivery, rather than focus primarily on constraining budgets. So why visibility of pricing outside South Africa is a challenge? Again, Jacques did say something about this. In the public sector, we have the master procurement list, which is starting to be a barrier for bringing in affordable, innovative, non-genericized medicines. Companies do not want to compromise their business in international markets by 
ensuring or allowing their, their net price in South Africa to be externally visible. This happened a few years ago when in Saudi Arabia, they were able to reference South African prices. And one would argue that the market in Saudi Arabia is far more advanced than the market in South Africa and people are able to pay prices that many of us in South Africa cannot pay. But once they've seen what it is that we pay in South Africa, they also want the opportunity to pay the same low prices that we pay. And when one considers that South Africa is but a small portion of the, the, of the global market, then you can understand that no company would want to risk their bigger global markets at the expense of such a small market as South Africa. And the impact this has in the private sector is that it also limited, it, it, there's limited access to new innovative medicine-based, I mean, evidence-based medicines in the private sector. So the single exit price is visible globally, and this is a problem. This is a slide that I've actually borrowed from Jacques. The unintended consequences of SEP, the single exit price. For one thing, medicine inflation is lower than general health inflation, and many people often do not emphasize this point. Now, external reference pricing due to transparent net pricing actually leads to people referencing our prices. And then what happens is that companies are really averse to continuing in this manner. And one would have to say that South Africans seem to be punished for following the WHO guidelines. Now, when you look at the sales of new medicines, which were launched, launched and this is per IQVIA report of 2010-22, in the US, just under 65% of medicines were launched. Europe had just under 17% of medicines launched. Japan, 6%, the rest of the world under 10% and the emerging pharmaceutical markets such as the BRICS, Mexico, India and, India, and Indonesia and Turkey were responsible for less than 4%. And when you consider that by value, the South African market is small, South Africa is responsible for a lot less than 1% of the global pharmaceutical market, then you can understand what harm uh, will be done to the people in South Africa who need access to these medicines if uh, reference pricing and external referencing of the prices is allowed to continue. Price visibility is, of course, exactly the kind of problem that I think needs to be emphasized here. Increased price visibility across countries could have detrimental effects on the market and on patient access by rewarding inefficiencies and, and undermining differential pricing. It also increases inequalities in access between countries. The lower income countries would suffer the main consequences from increased visibility of net prices in terms of higher prices and or delayed access. Thus, differential or tiered pricing rests upon confidentiality in national pricing agreements and the elimination of reference pricing. And that's what we say in the next two slides. As the pharma industry, we believe that a single pricing dispensation is not appropriate for medicines to be procured by the NHI fund or under any dispensation, even before we get to NHI, which as Dr. Nicholas Crisp himself has said, might not happen in our lifetime. So we're not talking about NHI, we're talking about now. A flexible pricing framework that allows differentiated or responsive pricing is proposed. This would allow responsiveness to the needs of geographical areas, different levels of care and negotiations directly with providers as envisaged by section 38.6 of the NHI bill. Differential pricing will also include flexibilities, or we say, let us include flexibilities in future pricing regulations that set a maximum price per medicine, allow for price negotiations with payers in the private sector, 
allow price negotiations as part of the tendering system for medicines in the public sector. And this is particularly so where you have a single source product that's sourced by just one company. And we say permit a model of price volume discounts and confidential discounts. Differentiated medicine prices based on volume, setting, be it public or private sector, rural or urban, or indication will accelerate the diffusion of innovative medicines. And just to conclude, making the same points that Jack made in one of his slides, these are the principal outcomes that will accrue to our patients if we resort responsibly to alternative reimbursement models. I will not go through them so that we have more time to have our discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bada, um, uh, for those interesting comments. Um, let me ask all the panelists to switch on their cameras and uh, we'll just maybe go through some of the questions in the Q&A. But as, as I open, um, let me ask you, uh, Prof. Neymar, and I want to just maybe reframe uh, the, one of the questions in the Q&A and ask you perhaps to share your thoughts. Often when uh, there's engagement with payers or funders, uh, as, you, as you refer to them, um, on efficiency or improving uh, healthcare issue, health system issues. The issue focuses on cost. How do we move the conversation from just to be a pure cost conversation? Uh, Lauren touched on it, value doesn't equal price. How do we shift the conversation to really start generating meaningful engagements about increasing patient value, increasing societal value, but not purely focusing on price? Or, or focusing on reducing costs. And that's the issue around you know, switching from one drug to another in formularies because we are looking for the most, for the cheapest drug at any one point. Sandile, I hope you can hear me. Thank you for that. Um, the big issue that I think we struggle with is that your, um, how would I say, your administrator, managed care provider, pharmacy benefit, provider often work in silos with, with other words my benefit for hospital is this my benefit for medicine is this I'm not seeing a holistic picture of the cost of the patient over time I've done a, just done a study and we've used the uh, Italian database where they looked at about seven million people just looking at if I give better care in hypertension uh, with a little bit more expensive medicine, does it make a difference to the total cost of care? And the answer was yes. The biggest contributor to cost was hospitalization and medicine. Guess what? I reduced my hospitalization rates but because my compliance went up and therefore the total cost of care to that patient was significantly lower in Europe, mm -hmm. in euros for that entire cohort of patients that were studied in that, in, in that particular real world analysis. So I think it's time that uh, we as doctors challenge the way that funders, and, and it's not all of them, look at, at, at medicine. Medicine should be part and parcel of the total treatment continuum and should not be seen as a pharmaceutical benefit in, its, uh, in isolation. So um, we often forget that I'm treating a patient and all the treatment and care of that particular patient should be considered. And the patient cannot be just seen for a specific disease. And I think there, there is the mis disconnect here. And that will only help if we sort of take hands with the Lawrence of the world. And as doctors say, this is what we think is correct. Then have an open discussion where we can say this is the cost of care, this is the benefit that's achieved, what is the value transferred, and what's the cost of that value? Are we willing to pay more, or is the or is the action that we by spending more we actually save more because we often do not see that calculation within the funding environment? So I think we as doctors as as a, as a, a almost a collaborative effort in that. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Neyman. Um, Lauren, let me let me ask you this question. Uh, also, just touching on maybe a perspective from the from the Q and A around uh, 
adverse effects of, of medicines. And um, how do we start bringing, you know, into, into the conversation when we, you know, because FIFO service obviously allows us to pay for sim simply buying the drug and it doesn't matter what happens downstream. How do we actually ensure that outcomes that matter to patients are measured in these models as we engage and we ensure that we, we incentivize good outcomes um, reduce side effects and, and also linking that to perhaps actually penalty uh, incentives or uh, negative incentives that penalties or <laughs> Thanks, Andili. So um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to say which, which disease it is because it'll, it'll say which um, medicine are, but I was recently at a conference and it was one it, it was a story that was told to me that you know it was one of those aha moments again and i hope I, by explaining this i get to, to 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 tell you that so there's a particular medication that patients with a certain disease have and it's given intravenously they go they sit for uh, the in, for the um drip for uh, 3 hours every 3 weeks they're there they have their drip they go home and that's the end of that but innovation said, oh, wait, we can now make it that you can come and get your 30 day supply and then you take two pills every day, morning and night, and you must take it with, the, with food and 20 minutes after food, you must only take it with water. And, um, but a side effect of this is that you're going to have forgetfulness. And the patients turned around and said, but I'd rather go and sit in the tree in the chair and have an IV for three hours once every three weeks than have to remember twice a day to take my medication 20 minutes before my food. And for me, that was such an important thing because there was a there was a surcharge on the on, on the on the convenience of taking the, the, the medicine. But in the end, the patient of taking those 30 days, but in the end, the patient was like, no, I'd like it the old way. I still have to go to the hospital to pick up my medicine. So I might as well just go there every three weeks, sit in a, sit in a chair and have my IV. So this is something that we need to be talking about. And I think that's one thing that when we're designing reimbursement and designing um, patient reimbursement and, and disease reimbursement in this country, we're not talking to patients. We don't understand that. We're not talking to pay, to doctors to understand what is the real world situations that are, are playing. And that's the that's this, the intrinsic part that the doctors play on that because they are the first line of that real, real world evidence of these little nuances that when we were sitting in our glass, uh, our, our ivory towers making up benefit designs and the actuaries were crunching numbers, they didn't take that into account from a patient. So these are the things that did. questioning a patient and saying, would you spend a million rand for three months survival, extra survival, but you're going to be as sick as a dog? I can tell you there are very few patients that will agree to that. And that's an easy decision then for us, to, how we design reimbursement and, 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 and protocols and, and, and formularies when it comes to this. Um, so, you know, we often, you know, Zandili, you and I met when you were in discovery and we, we, we clashed on, on these design, benefit designs often. But one of the things that we, we forgot was that we needed to speak to the patients to understand that because it's not always that they design, they, sometimes they won't choose the biggest and best motor car. Sometimes, you know, the, the one that gets you from A to B is good enough for them. And we, we get surprised when that happens. Absolutely, Lauren. Uh, we always assume that actually people are just looking for the most expensive. And, and, and actually, when we bring the patient's voice, we understand truly their needs. And I, and I, I think there's also a difference between paternalism and actually advocacy, or in fact, hearing the voice of the patients. We, we don't need to represent them. They can speak for themselves but we can advise them appropriately. But let me come to you because uh, you've got a long history in national drug policy and effectively medicines policy in the country. The question around SCP, of course, there was, uh, there was, a, there was a rationale at the time when the, SCP, when, the, when, the, when the legislation was changed. 
and there's always often um, or there's always a question from the legislators or policymakers around ne uh, uh, incentives or removing uh, in, uh, negative incentives when people are allowed to actually then negotiate behind closed doors and reach amicable discussions or, or solutions. How do we ensure that we can, um, you know, maybe move from the current policy, which is prohibitive in terms of innovation and actually finding sustainable uh, pricing and, and, and deriving value from the medicines available, whilst ensuring that there are, you know, we, we, we are a country assorted with corruption, but we, we also at the same time um, don't reintroduce actually corrupt practices um, that, uh, you know, that, that led to the implementation of SCP to start off with. Thanks, Sandile. It's all a matter of the process of policy making. You know, the process of policy making is like a cycle. You have a problem, you come with a problem statement, you say, oh, the perverse incentives in medicine are such that we need to come up with a tool that's going to prevent those from harming the patients and affecting the good choices that doctors have to make when they have to treat their patients. And then we came up with a single exit price. But one really has to say, with time, it did manage to get rid of all those perverse incentives, but it also had unwanted consequences. And that's where policy making actually says to you, you've got to go back and look at whether we are still deriving the benefits that we had wanted to derive from introducing this policy. And if there are unwanted consequences, surely then we have to go back to the drawing board, call all the stakeholders and say, guys, look, we believe that this has served its time and now it's time for us to move on and get something else. And that unfortunately is what has not happened. The single exit price has had its time and we now do need to move on to ensure that innovation can be more accessible to patients and it's not uh, prevented from getting to patients simply because now we believe that we cannot allow discounts, we cannot allow volume-based dis discounts. Yes, there was a good reason for that at the time, but we do need to move on and look at the unwanted consequences of these policies and get something better in place. We are unfortunately out of time. Uh, thank you for that, but uh, let me maybe ask all the panelists to just share some thoughts and I'm gonna give some poignant maybe directly um, over a minute just to allow a uh, <laughs> closing remark. Um, I'm gonna start with you, uh, Prof. Neyman. How do we ensure that uh, firstly practitioners um, participate in these discussions? Because often um, I think to Lauren's point, these, are, these models or these discussions happen uh, in ivory towers where the voice of the clinician is uh, fairly unrepresented and uh, hardly ever the, 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 it's a prescription to the, to the, to the doctors. We, I mean, I'm taking also from the comments in the Q&A around formularies um, are implemented by schemes without the solid voice of the, of the specialists or the clinicians on the ground. How do we ensure as you close prof that the voice of the clinician and they participate and we create opportunities for them to really lead the conversation in developing alternative models of reinvestment, particularly where medicines are concerned? Yeah, um, there's a short answer from my side. I think it's important that the learned societies get involved a little bit more with the decision making around that. And also because the learned societies at the moment also forms partnerships with associations uh, such as that of Lauren. So they need to become part and parcel of the decision making process. Your, 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 your SAMAS, your heart failure, your uh, SARAS, all of those associations from doctors need to also form opinions and push for what is best for the particular patient in an open, fair and transparent way. If something is totally unaffordable, it is unaffordable. But we often judge something purely on price and not looking at the outcome and the total cost of care. So it's important that the doctors uh, through their learned associations, I would think that be become uh, a, a much a stronger argument if it's done that way. Thank you, Prof. Uh, and I'm going to ask you, Bada, to go next. Um, how do we foster 
the culture of collaboration between and, and I'm and I'm grateful because this session involves patients, involves uh, the pharmaceutical industry, and it involves clinicians. But how do we uh, foster this culture of collaboration across all role players to ensure that we reach the best outcome for our patients? Because that's what puts us together in the first place, the fact that there's patients. Thanks, Sandile. It's important to ensure that all the role players get together in the room. A few weeks ago, we had a seminar somewhere next to the airport where Virtually every speaker had something to say about the role of the Department of Health and various government departments. There was not a single person from the department to hear what was being said about their role. And so that's wrong. We need to get everybody. And for me, the important thing is that people like Lauren, who represents the views, the pain of the patients, should be the ones leading these uh, collaborations. We need to have them right at the center of any discussion, but everybody has to participate, including government. We cannot afford to leave government out because they are the policy makers. They have to listen to what everybody is saying and they've come, got to come up with the policy making decisions. Thank you very much for those words, Pada. Uh, let me ask you to, uh, to, to go last, Lauren, and really just perhaps to, to, to just help us as clinicians, how do we always make sure that the voice of the patient uh, you know, runs uh, loud and clear in all of the day-to-day -day decisions? Because this is, I mean, this is obviously a policy-related uh, big discussion. These are, are much more complicated discussions. But when we talk about patient-centeredness, um, how do we, you know, in our day-to-day -day practice, how do we make sure that that actually is at the forefront of our minds as we as we make decisions for on behalf of our patients or we engage with medical schemes or payers on their behalf? Uh, how do we ensure that patient centeredness And what does it mean to you? When what would it look like to you as a patient advocacy group when we truly are offering patient-centered care? Thanks, Adili. So I think the first thing to remember is often you're dealing with a very scared patient and or a confused patient. So you as a healthcare practitioner are often the first line of defense for that patient or the first line of protection for that patient when it comes to their rights and to their, um, their, their responsibilities as well. So helping guide them to pay um, people like my organization can be the beginning and then working with our organization we have things like um pro, you know if there's been a decline at a medical scheme we run these kind of projects but we need engagement for the from the doctors because at the end of the day you're the clinical expert you know that patient you know their history you know their understanding so you are the proxy for that because the patient can't even do that. It's very rare that we see patients that are able to verbalize the clinical side of their, their treatment. They're, they're come in hen's teeth and you can, you know, for every hundred thousand patients, there's probably three or four that could do that in the, in the, in the places where they need to do that. So unfortunately, you become the proxy for that. But to know that there are groups like Campaigning for Cancer and patient groups that can help you and assist you in doing that. Um, you know, and it's, it's a work together scenario. Thank you very much uh, for that, Lorian. Uh, and it's a, it's a long journey, of course, um, but um, it's a journey we all have to traverse. We are committed to it. And um, I must thank all of the panelists for tonight for sharing your thoughts, your expertise and your inputs into this session. And to all the esteemed presenters, thank you very, very much for this truly informative session. Throughout the course of our discussion tonight, we've delved into the intricacies of various alternative reinvestment models, recognizing the potential to revolutionize the way we deliver, pay for and experience healthcare. We've also acknowledged that the path to adopting uh, alternative reinvestment models is not without its complexities. Therefore, transitioning requires careful planning, collaboration, and a keen understanding of the needs and concerns of all stakeholders, including patients, providers themselves, funders, and policymakers. It is a journey. It demands innovation and adaptability, qualities that we as healthcare professionals are well equipped to, equipped to embrace. 
in the context of South Africa, our discussions have really enriched, have been enriched by the awareness of the unique challenges and opportunities we face. We've explored how these alternative models can address issues of access, affordability, and quality of care. We've considered the roles of technology in facilitating transformation. So on behalf of, South, of SAMA, I would like to express my heartfelt appreciation for your advice, your participation, your willingness to share expertise and experiences and your dedication to the well-being of our patients. And to our attendees, thank you for your time. And we appreciate the contributions made in the Q&A session. And uh, the session has been invaluable and I've learned a lot myself. And uh, we hope to keep collaborating and work working together to continue to shape the future of healthcare for our country. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.